Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Out of the Park Developments Twitch channel. My name is Alex Murray, also known as AZ Axel, and today on This Week in Perfect Team, we are going through Cooper Sound Club 4. Yes! I have been waiting for the next set of the Cooper Sound Club for a very long time. I hope all of you have been just as excited as I have been. We have quite a lot to get through. Even with a shorter content than the last time I did this, we want to make sure we get everyone out of here before the end of the hour. So top of the hour, cards go live, everything goes live. Well, not cards, missions go live at the top of the hour, as well as some LEs, which we'll talk about in a second. So let's not waste any time. I know I don't have a tie. I even was looking at buying a fake t-shirt that had a fake tie on it. My apologies. You get uniform Alex instead. My apologies about that. But regardless, welcome everybody to episode 180 of This Week in Perfect Team. Now, before, before we get into the big information for the day, the content, we need to do some house cleaning. We need to do some house cleaning first, all right? So, one thing you need to know, we have an update to the game. OOTP23 has a new version, a new batch that was released this morning, I believe, to our forums. This is build 23.9, build 102, version 23.9, build 102. Now, there's a lot of patch note stuff that you can see in this list, but this bottom one is the most important. All right, this is the most important. For people who are part of the PTCS tournaments that are happening this weekend, I believe, you will need this patch. You will need this patch to be able to properly do the new roster restrictions, all right? So as it says, users, you need to update your game to be able to properly use the new roster restrictions. Without this patch, you can submit invalid rosters with ineligible players, and those will be removed after you have submitted your team. So to save yourself and us a lot of trouble, if you are part of the PTCS, please do make sure you get this new patch so that way you are able to do that properly. And for everybody else, get the patch because it has a whole bunch of bug fixes, crash fixes, and a whole bunch of other stuff that is kind of important to being able to play the game properly. All right? All right. We got our house cleaning out of the way. Let's move on to the fun, fun, fun stuff, shall we? All right. Let's start off with the Perfect League standings update. Now, it's been a really close, perfect league this week. As you guys can see, not a whole lot of teams are running away with it this week as they were last week. Although, the Castroville Mashers in the upper left-hand corner for the AC East Division, seven and a half games ahead of the FFS Snails. So, they do have a pretty good record, 64 and 35 as of 8.20 p.m., Eastern time was when this snapshot was taken. So as you can see, they've been doing pretty good. The Dallas Skyline Sluggers down here in the NC West Division at 60 wins and 40 losses. Those are the two best teams so far. Now, as you can see, lots of close competitions. Half a game out for the uh, NC Roof Division. We've got a six-game lead for the NC West. One and a half game lead for the NC Central. Up in the NC East, we've got a four and a half game lead for the Fog Fogtown Stars TBD. And then across the way, we have a two and a half game lead for the Vancouver Vibes. The new New York Planet Express have a one game lead over Gonzaga and Anaheim currently. And then there's a two game lead for the McNoosh Brigade. That's the BFF squad over there over the Sleepy Hollow Horsemen before, of course, we get to our Castroville Mashers with their 64 wins, 7.5 games over the Snails. So, the best of luck to all of you who are trying to compete for the Perfect League Championship and the playoffs that will be happening on Sunday. Keep building your teams, and hopefully the content today may give you just a little bit of an edge if you can get some of the CC4 cards, as we're going to be referring to them as. All right. Let me get myself set up and ready to go. Let's begin, shall we? Let's start off with our LEs. As is always the case, we have some limited edition cards for all of you this evening. They'll be in packs at the top of the hour. I'm not sure how I feel about this Dishnet impersonator. Ah, uh, coming in from the, uh, from, the, from the stands. I hear them already, the critics. But let's go. LEs, let's start off with our lowest one. This is going to be a bronze LE. 100 copies available of this one. It's going to be 61 overall. This is a catcher. Rick 
Cicerone. And yes, I was told the inter the, uh, the pronunciation of that last name. I thought it was Cerrone, but no, it is Cerrone. Rick Cerrone, a 1980s catcher representing the New York Yankees. He played from 1975 to 1992. His ratings are as follows. Babbitt at 55, power 54, avoid K 69, contact 62. Gap power of 76 and the eye up around 52. Now, you will notice he has some interesting splits for those batting situations, though. He actually flip-flops a little bit, favoring lefties for Babbitt, favoring power for righties. And then he goes back to lefties for the avoid Ks, splits it evenly on the contact, goes back to lefties for gap power, and then almost splits it even for the eye. So a very interesting bronze level limited edition catcher here in Rick Cerrone. Now, the bigger part about him, though, is the defense. 83 catcher rating, that is 71 catcher ability, and a 100 catcher arm. And we'll talk a little bit about the arm in a second here. No speed, really to speak of, a little bit of stealing, but you're really not going to run with this guy. You're not going to use him to bunt. Just, just don't even think about it, all right? Now, he played for a lot of teams. He played for a lot of years. He was normally and usually a backup catcher, except for one year we'll talk about as well. He played for Cleveland, Toronto, the New York Yankees, Atlanta, Milwaukee, Boston, the New York Mets. So he went to both New York teams and the Montreal Expos. Now, the big year we want to talk about is his 1980 year with the New York Yankees. In that year, he played 147 games. He replaced the pass catcher, and he was the starting catcher for 1980. His slash line was 277, 321, 432 for the year. He had 30 doubles, 14 home runs, and 85 RBIs as a catcher with a 51.8 caught stealing percentage, which is fantastic for a catcher. He had a 4.2 war for that 1980 season. Some cool little tidbits about Rick Cerrone before we move on from him at this point. He is a two-time College World Series participant, and in 1987 to 1988, for the two combined years, he played for New York, the Yankees, and Boston, of all teams. And you are right about that. He was also 7th in MVP in 1980. I was forgetting to mention that as well. Thank you for reminding me about that. But in those two years, 1987 to 1988, he played 194 games at catcher and committed one error. Just one. That is pretty gosh darn good. Now, Cerrone is not just a baseball player. He has continued his baseball career into his retirement. He actually had an ownership stake in the Kansas City Royals farm team in Wilmington, Delaware. That was the Wilmington Blue Rocks. And he also founded the Newark Bears, which is an independent or was an independent Atlantic team. In 1998, he founded that. It ran from 1998 to 2013. Notable players who played on the team are Ricky Henderson, of all people. Jose Lima was on the team for a little bit of time. Edgardo Alfonso, Armando Benitez, Carl Everett, Keith Folk, and Lance Johnson. He had some pretty big names come on to his independent team, and they won two championships in that time period. Unfortunately, they are no longer happening as a team in the East Coast at this point, as it did get shut down in 2013. So... Rick Cerrone is going to be in packs at the top of the hour. A hundred copies of Rick Cerrone. Newark? It's just Newark? <laughs> Newark. Newark. Is that how it's pronounced? Already. Already, I'm getting the pronunciations wrong. Newark, I'm guessing, is how it's supposed to be pronounced. I'm a, I'm a West Coast person. East Coasters, you lose me with your pronunciations. It's just what happens. Oh, that's Delaware. Ah. Ooh, now I'm hurting different people on the East Coast. That's not good. My apologies about that. Let us move on as fast as possible from Rick Cerrone. Our next limited edition card is going to be a 25-copy diamond relief pitcher. And this is going to be Todd Worrell. 25 copies of a 94 overall relief pitcher. Closing pitcher representing the 1986 season is Todd Worrell. And let's get something started here really fast. Trivia. Now, Todd Worrell in 1986 won the Rookie of the Year as a relief pitcher. And we'll talk about that 1986 season out there. 
there have been six relievers who have won the Rookie of the Year award as relievers since 2000. Who are those winners? Chat, you can work on that while I give you the details and spill the details about Todd Worrell. 93 stuff, 115 movement, 93 control for Todd Worrell. 88 fastball, 82 slider, 64 changeup makes up the three pitches he'll be having in perfect team. Now, his splits are a little bit strictly favoring right-handed batters. So he is going to be much better against righties and lefties, as you see the 86 to 98, the 107 to 122, and the 91 to 95. So the control's decent. He'll be good at control against both sides. But that movement boost against the right-handed batters and that stuff boost against the right-handed batters may make you be a little bit more particular about when you'd like to have Todd Worrell pitch. He is also an extreme fly ball pitcher, but with 115 movement, that is perfectly fine. You can get away with that. Not a problem. Now, let's talk about his 1986 season before we talk about his career. In 1986, it was his rookie season. He did play in 1985, but 1986 was, in fact, his Rookie of the Year campaign. He played in 74 appearances in 1986. He completed, he finished 60 games, which means that the St. Louis Cardinals used him to complete baseball games very, very often in the 1986 season. He had 36 saves that year, 103 and two-thirds innings pitched. So they used him not just for one inning, they used him for multiple innings on multiple occasions. He had a 2.08 ERA for that year. Again, he was Rookie of the Year that year. And he had a 2.5 WAR just in 1986. Now, Todd Worrell is an interesting story of a relief pitcher and kind of a what-if kind of story. From 1985 to 1989, he played in St. Louis the entire time. He had 281 games. He completed or finished 218 of those, mostly as a saver, as a closer. 126 saves, 2.64 on the ERA numbers, and had a 7.6 WAR. He did not play in 1990, and he was recovering in 1991 due to an injury, which made him lose two whole years of his career. He ended up coming back in 1992, played till 1997, played one year in St. Louis before heading out to the Los Angeles Dodgers on the West Coast, but he only ever amassed a 3.6 war after he got past the injury. A what could have been situation in Todd Worrell, who had an amazing jump start into his career, and it just never held through after the injury. But regardless, Todd Worrell into perfect team as a limited edition card. 25 copies will be available at the top of the hour. And I think that's about it. Oh, the trivia. I should give you all the answers. All right. 2000 Rookie of the Year for the American League. Kazuhiro Sasaki, a relief pitcher. 2005, Houston Street. 2009, all the way through 2011, saw three relievers come through. Andrew Bailey in 2009, Neftali Feliz in 2010, and Craig Kimbrell in 2011. And the final, the sixth reliever to win Rookie of the Year award was actually in 2020, and that was Devin Williams. So that is your trivia to begin our LEs. Let's move on to our final LE of the evening. And this one might not be, this one might not be as familiar to some of you people out there. I was not familiar with this person, had to look them up and do some research. And we're talking about a 98 overall New York Yankees pitcher. And we're going to be talking about Allie Reynolds, 1951 starting pitcher for the Yankees. 25 copies available of Allie Reynolds at the top of the hour. Now, Allie Reynolds is also another great what-if story, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the stuff on Reynolds is amazing. 120. Is it Reynolds? Not Reynolds? Reynolds? Mark Reynolds and Mark Reynolds, a D-backs player I should know as well. 190 stuff for Allie. 95 movement, 72 control, 94 on the fastball, 101 on the slider, and a 84 curveball with a 57 screwball. Reynolds, it's Reynolds. Okay, thank you. 
I'm about to say, it should be Reynolds. Now, the splits for Reynolds are very close. In fact, they're pretty much non-existent. So this is going to be a very good LE for a lot of people out there. A good starting pitcher that's going to be able to do good against both left-handed batters and right-handed batters on the mound. So fly ball pitcher, 96 stamina, 48 on that hold runners. Not exactly going to be very good on the, um, on the batting approach at this point, but that's not why you're getting Mr. Reynolds. Now, Reynolds played from 1942 to 1954 for the Cleveland team and the New York Yankees. In his career, he had a 3.30 ERA. He was 182 and 107 on the wins and loss categories. He had 1,423 strikeouts in 2,492 innings pitched and also a third. 137 complete games for Mr. Reynolds. 36 shutouts out of those 137 complete games. He also had 48 saves. They used him as a reliever in his career quite often. He was a six-time All-Star, an ERA title holder in 1952, and he was a six-time World Series champion, 1947, 1949, 1950, 51, 52, and 53. He finished third and second in the MVP races in 1950. 51 and 1952 and that's where it doesn't quite go right unfortunately after the 1952 season during the 1953 season the new york yankees charter bus bus crashed into an overpass in philadelphia resulting in a back injury i believe for reynolds and unfortunately he was never quite the same after the um, after the injury, and he ended up retiring the following season. So right at his peak, Mr. Reynolds, unfortunately, did get involved in an accident, and an injury happened, and he was never the same, unfortunately. So I don't mean that to be a downer. He had a fantastic career, but another great what if. He, he could have had a couple more seasons with the Yankees. If he could have continued on, the amounts of statistics and stuff he could have been would have could have been so good. So, Allie Reynolds is going to be in PT23 at the top of the hour. Again, 25 copies of Mr. Reynolds. So, I hope that you guys can try to get some of these cards as they are limited editions. We'll only have limited copies of them. And we'll try to see which of you can take those as we get them added into pack at the top of the hour. All right. Now, let's get into... The stuff you all are here for. We have the fourth wave of the Cooperstown Club missions are here. So, let's talk about the newest members of the club. And before we do that, let us again, once again, I know some people know this already, but let's rehash how this works, all right? There are seven missions for each wave that we do of the Cooperstown Club missions. They're all based around certain themes. We have hits, war, control, power, catchers, relievers, and extra base hits. All right? Seven categories, which means seven rewards. And there's going to be five total waves of the Cooperstown Club missions throughout the fall. This is our fourth or penultimate of those waves all right for each mission you complete you will be receiving a player card as a reward we're going to be walking through every single one of those player card rewards here this evening if you complete all seven of the missions tonight you will receive a topper card which will be revealed at the end of the stream now big note if you complete the missions now, sorry, mission completion is required to receive the topper card, not the cards you get from completing the mission. So the cards you're going to be seeing tonight are not needed to be locked in to complete the to complete the topper card. To get the topper card, you do not have to somehow lock in the mission rewards. You just have to lock in the missions themselves. All right? If you complete all five waves, which we'll be having very, very soon down the road... We will be having two overall topper cards that we'll be revealing at a later date. So again, that's just to rehash basically all of this for everyone who is not aware of how this goes, how the Cooper Sound Club works. I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to be able to know how this works. And we're going to actually have examples by looking, 
we're gonna look back at the past a little bit because if anyone if anyone who has seen me stream or knows me they know that i like to do things a little bit differently around here so we're trying something new we are going to review the past cooperstown club players that have come out before the fourth wave for every single category all right so let's begin with the hits category now we have had three amazing people already put out in the hits category Lou Brock, Rod Carew, and you can just barely see him behind me, Paul Molitor. Paul Molitor came out in the last set. That was wave one, wave two, and wave three. Now, we are going to be adding another HITS member to this club. And we're going to be staying in the National League Central. Don't ask me why. We like the National League Central. We like seeing teams like the Cardinals. We like seeing teams like the Brewers. And we like seeing teams like the Cincinnati Reds. So our attribution or our new person added to the Cooperstown Club on the hits category, this is going to surprise you all a little bit, it's Frank Robinson. Frank Robinson is the hits reward for the evening. Played from, sorry, not played. Let's start with the ratings first. 79 BABIP, 100 power. 79 avoid K, 103 on the contact. 98 gap power, 93 I. Oh, just a piece of advice for everyone out there. There's a lot of blue tonight. A lot of blue, okay? there's You're going to see a lot of blue tonight. The splits, very, very good. Frank Robinson hits both sides almost equally all the way down until you hit the gap power and the eye where there's just an itty bitty bit amount of splits. So Frank Robinson is good against lefties and he's good against righties. And the defense is also good. Good enough to play first base if you have to in a pinch. Very good at left field and pretty good at right field as well. The range, error, and arm, 87, 84, 81. He's going to do just fine in the outfield. And he also has a little bit of speed to boost. 72 speed, 61, oh, sorry, 81 on the stealing. My eyes deceived me for a second there. And 76 on the base running. Now, Frank Robinson played from 1956 to 1976. Played for Cincinnati, Baltimore, Los Angeles, and then the other Los Angeles team, California Angels, and the Cleveland team. 2,808 games played for Frank Robinson. He had over 10,000 at-bats, over 1,800 runs, 2,943 hits. He was basically just half a year away from surpassing the 3,000 hits total, which would have been phenomenal for him. 528 doubles, and then this is the kicker, 586 home runs, hence the ability to hit for contact and the ability to hit for power. His slash line for his career was 294, 389, and 537. And an interesting little tid note that I found, he had 198 hit by pitches. 198. He led the league multiple years getting hit by pitches. He was Rookie of the Year in 1956, MVP in 1961, and in 1966. He is still, he is still the only batter or only player in baseball history to win the MVP in both the American League and the National League. So... That, in and of itself, speaks volumes, I would imagine. He was a 14-time All-Star, and he was uh, elected into the Hall of Fame in 1982. 370 ballots, ballots over 415. Now, little bit of information about his All-Star appearances. He participated in two double All-Stars. Now, I don't know how many people are aware of the years that the MLB decided to do this, because I was not. And when I looked up his baseball reference page, I noticed that he looked like he had uh, duplicate all-star references in 1959 uh, and 1961. 
and I actually had to do some research. I don't know how I didn't know this. But from 1959 to 1962, the MLB decided to do double All-Star games in order to be able to use the second All-Star game to help raise money for the MLB players' pension fund. Now, this means that basically we can absolutely double up on those two years for his All-Star appearances because that number, by technicality, gets to be two for those years. So he played in two of those All-Star, double All-Star games, making his total of All-Star appearances to 14 for his career. We'll talk a little bit more about that down the road. We have another player who's involved in those double All-Stars, maybe all four of them. And that is our hits person for the evening. Let's move on to our next category after we get through here. There we go. Let's talk about control. All right. We've had some pretty good control pitchers across the board through our CC experiences at this point. We do have one Miracle, Dizzy Dean, and right behind me, Roy Holiday was our last one. So let's see what we can do about our fourth one, shall we? Our fourth entry into the control category for the Cooperstown Club, and I've seen a lot of people do vote or do uh, suggestions and what they believe it is and guesswork, and I don't know how many people guessed this. I think one person did. Our new entry into the control category is Christy Mathewson, representing the New York Giants. He has 87 stuff. 95 movement, 101 on the control. He's a fastball, screwball, and curveball pitcher. That's a 78 fastball, 68 curveball, 97 screwball, which is why the splits are backwards. He is better against left-handed batters than right-handed ones. That's a 90 to 84 split, 96 to 94 split, and then a 103 to 100 split. So that screwball going to be a big impact in being able to have a right-handed pitcher take down left-handed batters. Now, he has 110 stamina. And we'll talk about why that in a little bit here. He throws 93 to 95. He has 51 hold runners. Christy Mathewson, a peak card for the control category. He played in 1900 to 1916 for the New York Giants and Cincinnati. He was 373 wins, 188 losses for his career. A career 2.13 ERA pitcher. My apologies about that. 552 games started. He completed 435 games. That is a lot of complete games. 4,788.2 innings pitched. That's a lot of innings. And 2,507 strikeouts. He was a five-time ERA title holder and a two-time Triple Crown winner. And yes, we will talk about 1905 in a second here. Do not worry. I have all kinds of stuff about that. He was entered into the Hall of Fame in 1936, 205 votes over 226 total. And in 1901, here's a cool little piece of information for about Mathewson. From 1901 to 1904, the first couple of years after his rookie season, he was struggling with wild pitches. For those four years, he had a combined total of 68 wild pitches. He changed something, and from 1905 to 1916, he only gave up 46 total wild pitches. Hence the control pitcher at this point. Now, a lot of people who know about Mathewson know about his World Series in 1905. The Giants were playing the Philadelphia Athletics. It was a seven-game series. They win the series in five games, four to one. Mathewson pitches three of those five games. Dead ball era. Pitchers go very often. But he did it in such dramatic fashion. 27 innings pitched for those three games, which if you're doing the math, that's complete games across the board and zero runs allowed. Not zero earned runs, zero runs allowed. Three complete game shutouts to basically single-handedly win the Giants the World Series in 1905. And he did it by only giving up one walk 
and having 18 strikeouts to his name. Christy Mathewson was a dominant pitcher in the dead ball era, and he joins us as our CC4 control pitcher this evening. A big one right there. Let's move on to our next category. I believe we've spent enough time talking about the great Christy Mathewson. Let's talk about catchers. Now, you might look at this list, and it makes sense. They're all catchers. Yes, I know that's low-hanging fruit, but I have to try somehow. We have had some great catchers in the past. Carlton Fisk, Gary Carter, and of course, Mickey Cochran added to our catchers group, our catchers missions for the CC or the Cooperstown Club. And we're going to be adding another one this evening. And um, let's just say I was hungry this afternoon. I was really hungry. And Discord reminded me of something that I haven't had in a long time. And that's pizza. No, wait, that says Piazza. Mike Piazza is our catcher for CC4. Mike Piazza is going to be coming in with 74 BABIP, 108 on the power, 90 avoid K, 105 contact, 85 gap power, and 84 I. Oh, don't worry. We'll get Todd Pratt in here sooner or later, Nicolino. We'll get him in here. As a DVX fan, I know all about Todd Pratt. Yes. The splits for Piazza. Not too shabby. He does have a little bit of a split on that power and a little bit on the contact. 75 to 73 for the BABIP. 118 to 104 for the power. The 91 to 89 avoid K split is not too bad. That'll be just fine. But then the 112 to 104, mostly because of the power on that contact split, is going to mean that he is going to fare a little bit better against left-handed pitchers. And it only gets worse. The gap power, 97 to 81, and the eye, 91 to 82. Mike Piazza also has some pretty good defense as well. He is a 90-rated catcher for this card, 94 on the catcher ability, and 64 on the catcher arm. Let's get the trivia out of the way really fast because, of course, we're doing a lot of Rookie of the Year stuff with these players. Now, we're going to talk a lot about the Rookie of the Year stuff above but there was a Los Angeles Dodgers player who finished ninth in the same year that Mike Piazza won the Rookie of the Year award. He finished ninth. This person did finish ninth. Who was the person who finished ninth in the Rookie of the Year voting in 1993? Now, Mike Piazza played from 1992 to 2007. His rookie year was 1993. He did win the Rookie of the Year that year. He played for Los Angeles, the Dodgers, of course, the Florida Marlins, the New York Mets, the San Diego Padres, and the Oakland Athletics. But most people remember Mike Piazza for his Mets years and his Dodger years, as those were his heart and soul of his careers. He had over 2,000 hits for his career, 427 home runs. That's true. Some people do remember the small amount of time he had with the Marlins. I will give you that as well. Some people do remember the, um, what was it, the Marlins week at that point. He had a career 59.5 war, which for a catcher is very, very, very good. He again won the Rookie of the Year in 1993. He was a 10-time Silver Slugger during his career. He was a 12-time All-Star, and the number 31 was retired by the Mets in 2016, the same year that he entered into the Hall of Fame, getting 365 of the 440 ballots. Now, the Los Angeles Dodgers, during that little amount of time, were very, very good at developing prospects, and Mike Piazza was just one of many. This is a little tidbit information about Piazza. He joined a collect few players who basically from 1992 to 1996, the Dodgers were winning all of the Rookie of the Year awards. They had Eric Karros in 92, Mike Piazza in 93, Raul Mondesi, the father of Adalberto Mondesi, who's playing today, in 1994. 95 was Hideo Nomo, and 96 was Todd Hollinsworth. The Dodgers have always been very, very good at developing rookies. And the trivia answer for the bottom. Who was the rookie that finished ninth in the 1993 Rookie of the Year voting? It was Pedro Martinez. So a little bit of trivia there for the Mike Piazza card. Mike Piazza. Mike Piazza joins the catcher's group 
for CC4. You'll be able to try to get him this evening. Let's move on to the relievers. We're making good time. Let's keep going. The relievers. We've had some very good relievers in the past. We've had Lee Smith, Raleigh Fingers, and Trevor Hoffman. Trevor Hoffman was a very, very good relief pitcher during his time. All of these were very, very good relief pitchers across the board. Now, there are quite a few, there are quite a few relievers who are left that we could be picking from. There are quite a few relievers that are left. But we want to return to a team we've already had a reliever from. We are going to go back to the A's. And our reliever for CC4 is Dennis Eckersley. And we're going to have a whole lot of fun talking about Eck. Oh, boy. 101 on the stuff, 102 on the movement, 112 on the control. If you do not have a closer, you have one now. <laughs> All right? This is good. This will play. The splits are a little bit in favor of the righties, but 96, 100, 110 versus lefties is still more than enough for most people. All right? Now, you say this is a starting pitcher. We'll talk about that in a second. Versus righties, 105, 104, 113 for those stuff, movement, and control splits. He is a very, very good relief pitcher. Fastball at 89, slider at 73, curveball at 86. And he is an extreme fly ball pitcher, but with this kind of movement, again, with this kind of movement, that is not a problem. That is not a problem. Eckersley played from 1975 to 1998 with Cleveland, Boston, the Chicago Cubbies, Oakland, and St. Louis. He had 197 wins in his career, 390 saves. He played in over 3,000 innings, 3,285 and two-thirds to be exact. He had 100 complete games, and he... And he finished 569 of the 695 appearances he made as a relief pitcher. Another pitcher who closed out ball games. Even if it wasn't a save, they had him closing. He was the last pitcher that you would see coming out of the bullpen. He won the Cy Young and MVP as a reliever in 1992. He has been an all-star six times, or was an all-star for six years. Two-time Rolaids relief winner, which is for relievers only, basically. 1989 World Series winner, and he was entered into the Hall of Fame in 2004 with 421 of the 506 ballots going his way. He had a career 45.5 war as a star. Starter in 1975 till 1986. And this is where it gets interesting. He was not only a good reliever, he was a good starter. He played many, many years as a starter and then continued to be a reliever the rest of his career, which was 1987 to 1998. He only had a 16.8 war during that period of his time, but I want to highlight the last bit on that on that uh, uh, text information up there. From 1987 to 1992, the beginning of his relief career, he had 15.5 war for that short period of time. He was dominant as a reliever at the beginning and a starter at the beginning of his career for a very, very long time. Dennis Eckersley is our reliever for CC4. I hope you guys have a fun time being able to get this mission completed and get potentially... This might be one of the newest, best relief pitchers you can get at this point. All right, let's move on to power. We have had some, we have had some very good power cards in the past. We have seen Dave Winfield, we have seen Jim Tomey, and we have seen Harmon Killebrew. So, what are we adding to the power listings this time? Well, we've kind of been on a bit of a trend with American League players. So we're going to stick in the American League. 
but we're not going to stick in the American League Central. I think we've absolutely oversaturated the American League Central. This is just too many. You got the you got Cleveland, you got Minnesota. I think we're done. I think we're done with the American League Central. And we're we're not going to go to the West, okay? We're not going to go to the West. It has to be the East. We have to go to the American League East. And we have to go to the pinstripes because you know we have to go to the pinstripes because we have to get Mickey Mantle in here. Mickey Mantle is our power winner. He is our mission reward for power. 86 BABIP, 117 on that power rating, 51 on the avoid K, so he's going to be susceptible to striking out. But when you have 117 power and 105 contact, he's going to do a good job. 103 on that gap power, 110 on the eye. The splits are pretty even. Ever so slightly in favor of lefty and righty as we go down the list. 88 versus 85 for the Babbitt. Just a little bit better against left-handed pitchers. Same power rating on both sides. He will hit homers off of everybody. 51 on the start on the avoid Ks across the board. That means the contact is 106 versus 105. So a little bit better against left-handed pitchers, but not by much. 105 to 102 on the gap power. 108 to 111 on that eye. Now. The defense is also good. It's also very, very good. First base, 50 overall rating. Left field, 109. 79 in center. And in right field, 102. The abilities for the outfield at this point, 81 range, 103 on that error, and 92 on the arm. So while you might not stick him in center, you can absolutely rest assured that he can play left field and right field like the best of them. His speed is 57, stealing at 84, and an 86 base running. And as people were mentioning, yes, his sack bunt and bunt for hit is not that good. I would highly recommend that you don't have him bunt. Because he's got to hit home runs. Mickey Mantle played from 1951 to 1968 only for the New York Yankees. 1,676 runs for Mickey Mantle. 2,415 hits. 536 home runs. He had a lot of them. 1,509 RBIs. 1,733 walks. So he walked a lot as well as hit for average. He hit home runs. And he also hit the ball all over the field. His slash line is 298, 421, 557 for his career. That's a 172 OPS plus for his career and 4,511 total bases for Mickey Mantle in his career. He finished his career with a 110.2 WAR. He was only a winner of the Gold Glove for one year, but he won 20, sorry, not won, he was a part of 20 All-Star games. And yes, he participated in all four of those double All-Star games in 1959 to 1962. See, we wrap stuff around and we bring the stories back. That's what we do. He was the MVP in 1956, 1957, and 1962. He won the Triple Crown in that 1956 season, and he was a seven-time World Series winner with the Yankees. He got elected into the Hall of Fame in 1974 with 322 ballots out of 360. Five. So Mickey Mantle is in as the reward for the CC4 mission for power. I hope you guys are going to be able to get this card. This card could be huge in your hopes and dreams of being able to win the perfect league. All right. All right. Let's move on to war. Now, we have had some interesting names for the war category. I think some of these have surprised some people. We have Phil Necro, we have Kid Nichols, and we have behind me Eddie Plank. And of course, we have no logo in the middle, which I know people love to bring up, but we just can't put a logo there. I don't know why. Regardless, we need to add a fourth one to this category. We need to add a fourth person to the war category, and that is going to be 
somebody that we teased on the Discord, or in the Discord this afternoon, and I think everybody knows who we teased. It was pretty easy. It looked like his other card. We all know who this is, so let's just get it over with. We're adding Peak Tom Seaver as the War Category Mission Reward. Tom Seaver will be bringing a 118 stuff, 100 movement, and 94 control to the mound. That's a 97 fastball, 88 slider, 83 curveball, 74 changeup, and a 95 sinker. Woo! That is good. That is very good. His splits are a little bit in favor of right-handed batters. 114 to 121 for the stuff, 98 to 101 for the movement, and then the control is about where it should be. 93 to 94 for Tom Saver. 102 on that stamina. He's not going to hold runners. We only have four rating on the hold runners. And um, not too bad on the batting ratings either at this point as well. Pretty good for the batter at this point, if he has to bat. Tom Seaver played from 1967 to 1986. He played for the Mets, the Reds, the White Sox, and the Red Sox. So he liked his Sox teams. 311 wins for his career. He had a 2.86 ERA for his entire career. And 231 complete games. 61 of those shutouts. 4,783 innings pitched, 3,640 strikeouts. That resulted in a 106.0 war for Tom Seaver. It's a guar? Is it war? <laughs> Am I saying war incorrectly as well? Good grief. He was a 12-time All-Star, won the Rookie of the Year in 1967. And he won the Cy Young three times in his career in 1969, 1973, and 1975. He won the World Series in 1969 with the Mets at the young age of 24. That makes me wonder what I was doing at the age of 24 in my life. He is a three-time ERA title holder. And for the Mets, just for his career with the Mets... He ended up winning 198 games, had a 2.57 ERA, 171 complete games, 200, 2,541 strikeouts. And he was entered into the Hall of Fame in 1992 with 425 of the 430 ballots available. I don't know why five people did not put him into the Hall of Fame. It, I, I don't know. I don't think we'll ever know. Let's go ahead and move on as, again, Tom Seaver is our war category mission reward for the evening. All right? So... Let's get on to our next category. We've made good time. We're going to wrap up here. we got 10 minutes. 10 minutes to wrap up. Let's get to extra base hits. Now, we've had some really good extra base hits players as well. We've had Craig Biggio, Paul Wehner, and Joe DiMaggio as our extra base hits mission rewards. So let's add on a fourth person to this one as well. And our fourth person being added to this category, number four is Robin Yount. Robin Yount gets to be added to our list. 80 BABIP, 78 power, 93 avoid K, 100 on the contact, 96 on the gap power, and 69 on the eye. Now, the splits are very good. He has very limited split differences until you get down to the gap power and the eye. And that's a 101 to 95 split and a 79 to 66 split. So that's one, that one's going to be a little bit harder against the lefties versus against the righties versus the lefties. Now, what Yount lacks in a lot of blue for batting, he makes up for in defense. And we'll talk about the defense as well because you might notice this one's a little bit different than this one. He is going to be a 97-rated overall shortstop, 
and a 90 rated overall center fielder. That's 92 on the range for infield, 83 on the error, 95 on the arm, and 99 on the turn double play. For the outfield, his ratings are going to be 89 range, 96 error, and 85 on the arm. Now, he's not exactly a speed demon, but he does have a little bit of stealing ability. 57 on the speed, 79 on the stealing, and 68 on the base running. And he could put down a bunt if required. 56 on the sacrifice bunt, 65 on the bunt for hit. Robin played for only the Milwaukee Brewers from 1973 till 1993. He played in over 2,800 games for them, had over 11,000 at-bats, 1,632 runs scored, 3,142 hits for Robin, 583 doubles, 126 triples, 251 home runs, and 1,406 RBIs to go along with 271 stolen bases. For his career, he was a slash hitter 285, 342, 430, resulting in all of that to equal an 83.1 war career. Now, he was an MVP for two seasons in 1982 and 1989. He was a Gold Glove winner in 1982. He won the Silver Slugger three times. He was a three-time All-Star. And he was elected into the Hall of Fame in 1999, getting 385 ballots out of 497. And here's going to be our little bit of information in regards to why the air rating is a little bit different for Robin Yount. For the first 10 years of his career, Robin Yount was played at shortstop. And in those 10 years, he had 2,588 total chances. That's balls put in play directly to him that he was involved with a play. In those 2,588 chances, he made 272 errors. Now, I need to give some reference to how that looks because at this point, some people might look at that and go, that is terrible. Javi Baez, in his career to this date, has had 2,600 total chances and has had over 370 errors. So it's not Javi Baez, all right? But the Brewers made a very wise decision. For the last 10 years of his career, he played in center field. He had 3,056 total chances and committed 25 errors in 10 years. That's an average of only two and a half errors each year. So a great turnaround for a defensive player. Robin Yount is our extra base hits player for the evening. All right. Let's get to, I believe, our last one. We have our last category, which isn't even a category. It's the topper. It's time for our final reveal, our topper for the CC4 missions. We have had some good ones. We've had Carl Hubble, Ken Griffey Jr., and behind me, Sandy Koufax. Now, I had mentioned something in the Discord, and Khan is quick to point it out. I had mentioned that there's a second baseman in this group tonight. And we understand that some people believe that there might be a little bit of a lack of good second basemen out there right now. So, let's go ahead and give you all a second baseman and let's see what you guys think about it, alright? How would you like Nap Lajway? Nap is our topper for the Cooperstown Club 4 mission set. 101 on the batting, on the BABIP. Yes, Lajway. Lajway. 66 on the power, 103 on the avoid Ks, 118 on the contact, 104 on the gap power with 76 I. He will play first base and he will play second base and he plays a great second base at 106. 93 at that first base position is also not bad. 88, 87, 72, and 94 are his infield ratings. 64, 73, 68 for speed, stealing, and base running. A 93 sack bunt and a 100 bunt for hit. 
Now, as you can see from his splits, they are almost non-existent in any difference. 104 to 100 for the BABIP, 67 to 66 for the power, 104 to 102 on the avoid Ks. Results in the 121 to 116 on the contact split. 107 to 104 for that gap, and a 79 to 75 difference on the I. Now, Knapp played in 1896 to 1916 for Philadelphia and Cleveland. He had 9,590 at-bats, resulting in 3,243 hits, 657 doubles, 163 triples, 380 stolen bases, resulting in a, uh, a, um, a slash line of 338, 380, 466. He was good, and we'll explain why in a second here. He was a three-time batting title holder, won the Triple Crown in 1901, had a 106.9 war career, and he was, or no, he holds the 12th highest single-season batting average at 426, well, 4265, and that was in 1901. Now, that is if we include the Negro League statistics as major league levels, which we will. But if we take away people who hit less than 500 at bats in the season, for people who played the full career, uh, full, full season, if we do just those, Nap is third. Nap is third. He was entered into the Hall of Fame in 1937, getting 167 of the ballots. Sorry, 168 over 201 of the ballots. For his career, he holds some very prestigious league leaders, and those are going to be a 24th in career war. He is 24th in career batting average. He is 15th in hits, 8th in doubles, and 33rd in triples. Nap Lajue, and I hope I'm spelling that or I'm saying that correctly. I've been trying to make sure that I just Lajue, Lajue, Lajue. Nap Lajue is our topper for the evening, and a very good one at that. He will be a very good contact second baseman for you. And if this is what you guys are looking for, hopefully it will fill some needs at the second base position. And if not, at least he'll be able to compete with everybody else. All right, that is it. For Cooperstown Club 4, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here and for everything that you guys have been doing. The cards are on your screen. These are the ones we're going to have for the missions for the evening. Christy Mathewson, Dennis Eckersley, Frank Robinson, Mickey Mantle, Mike Piazza, Nap Lajue, Robin Yount, and Tom Seaver. And I have been peeing that cards. Let me see just to make sure that we are not rushing people into our servers yet. Give us a couple more minutes, and we'll make sure that stuff is good at the top of the hour. But regardless, regardless of that, we will make sure that we give you all the ping when those are ready to go. But that is going to be it for Cooperstown Club number four. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for watching. It has been an absolute pleasure to be able to get all of these released for all of you. Some people are saying missions are live. I knew that the cards were ready to go. And people are asking for more time to be able to get that last little drop in there before the end of the day. All right, there's the announcement. We are live. Missions are up. These cards are ready for you to claim. Go get some Cooperstown Club 4 cards, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy those. I hope you had a fun time watching. I had a fun time hosting episode 180 of this week in perfect team i hope you guys have a great rest of your evening go get some new cards and let's see if they join your squad in your hunt for those perfect league championships 
for me and for everyone here at the OOTP team, thank you so much for watching. I will talk to you all very, very, very soon.